excited about this next project that we're doing. <laughs> it's called the Bible. <laughs> what a project. <laughs> wow, what a novel idea. Let's do the Bible. <laughs> but the reality of getting to a place of sharing what Jesus said brings me to a very humble gestalt kind of intensity because it kind of brings like right into focus something that I feel very passionate about which is obvious <laughs> yippee 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 but um very drawn to the idea that I'm angry about some of what's being said about what Jesus said and being interpreted as though Jesus needed someone to interpret it for him and that he wasn't specific enough that he couldn't speak for himself and that Jesus isn't real and that he's not alive and that he can't honestly have his own words spoken for himself about himself to reveal what he meant and that pisses me off Yeah. <laughs> if you believe that, oh well. <laughs> but when we face the Sermon on the Mount, when we come to grips with the idea that there's more to Christianity than sucking your thumb, when we come to Jesus and he doesn't give us the simplicity of simply saying, hey, you know what? I got grace for you, I got love for you, I got a wonderful plan for you, and this is the purpose, and you're just going to live a wonderful life. But when he comes and says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, or worse, he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. If you don't, you can't be my disciple. Then you come to a real tough decision. What do you do with Jesus? Where do you go? And Jesus said, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, it's a very direct confrontation for anyone who's watching this video or listening or reading it. Because it's going to hit you where it hurts. It's going to drive you to your knees. It will impact your soul to make you deal with subjects you don't want to. And I don't want you to escape the reality of what is said so you at least know the truth. What you do from there is between you and God because I'm not your confessor and I'm not your intercessor. Jesus is. He is your salvation and he's the author and the finisher of your faith. And he has done everything that is needed for salvation. But he has also said some powerful words that have to be stated and should have been at the moment you got saved because it was done so when he was walking on the earth. And they knew what he said and they knew what he meant. In this overview of looking at the Sermon on the Mount, it's for those people that you know want to do all this kind of like numerical numbers and get into you know where is it what is it how is it and you know let me go look it up the sermon on the mount is usually contained in matthew chapter five usually goes down through chapter seven and sometimes you can extend a few verses either way because sometimes those include captioning the environment that it was set in or some other pieces of information that might be needed in order to appreciate it better because there never were numbers in scripture sorry there wasn't originally people basically was able to regurgitate a lot of it to each other and at some point in time they wrote it down and passed around parchments of it which were written in long flowing form and depended upon the speaker or the reader they would enunciate or articulate it according to what they were emphasizing and in that respect the Holy Spirit was depended upon to really give the, the meaning of it because in those days they would sit down and, and gnash on it they would literally chew on the words and drive it home to mean what it said because 
they didn't have all of this to read. They had a little bit. They grabbed what Jesus said and took it to mean what it said and just kept driving at it until they got the gist of it. Because for them, it was life. They were dying daily and suffering persecution hourly, and many of them being torn apart by lions and killed because of the very words that Jesus said. So the subject of the Sermon on the Mount is not goofy. It's not meant to be, oh, piece of cake. I got grace. I can live it. No. It's meant to be the Son of God speaking to you as the Son of Man. So in this overview, I wanted to remind you of something that people don't do. I wanted you to go to the end of the story, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I wanted you to think on these things that said at the end of Jesus addressing his disciples, but the people were hearing also. He chose them, he appointed them, and he directed them to learn these sayings of his. And that's what he called them. And in sharing this, if we use the numbering system that's most popular, then we would say that this is in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. Jesus had just finished, well, let's start in verse 21, just so you don't think I'm interpreting it. And it's pretty serious. So, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, But Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, because of that, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, the entire Sermon on the Mount, these sayings of mine, these things that I am saying and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Does that mean we can interpret what we want out of that? Whosoever does these sayings of mine isn't he saying, do these sayings of mine? He's likened unto a man that builds a house upon a rock? Or do we just make this into a figurative church and that the church is built upon a rock? And then we have the house is built upon sand is not the church? Oh, so the symbolism isn't quite the same. Is it symbolic of being prophetic? Or is it reality of people living in houses and knowing that they were building houses and lived in communities and those communities were built upon stone and in those communities they knew what building a house upon sand would be like and that speaking to those people in those day in that day at that time when he said the person who does these sayings of mine this is what they are like that's the overview what do you like God help us if we're like the man who builds upon sand. In the Sermon on the Mount, it has always been my contention and has always been my warning. Do you really want to know? Because there's a great blessing in what Jesus said. You can read all the Beatitudes and say, oh, how blessed. But did you love your neighbor? Oh, yeah. Did you follow the commandments? Oh, yeah. So do you love your enemies? Uh-huh. Do you love the child molester? Uh-uh. Do you love the terrorists? Mm-mm. Then have you done those sayings of mine? 
What is what Jesus said? What kind of doing are you describing as you have done the things he said and yet forgotten the very words he spoke? In emotionals, with all of my emotion and all of my anxiety of caring for people, I'm crying out for people to really get a gist on this and saying to them, look, this is a devotional, so maybe one day you'll get it, maybe one day you won't, maybe the next year, maybe the next year, but it'll be there. So you can reread it, or you can look at it, or you can get devoted about it, and you can talk to God about it, and you can do your research, and you can challenge it, and you can argue it, and you can debate it, and you can fight with it, and you can wrestle with it, and you can say it doesn't exist, but the one thing you can't do is you can't say it isn't written, and you can't say I made it up, because Jesus said, and from that moment on, the rest was history, and it became Christianity. So for you today, in devotions, what will you do with what Jesus said.